Good evening and welcome. Um, it's my very great, great pleasure to be introducing Professor Katie Mack to speak to us this evening. Professor Mack is a theoretical astrophysicist who studies a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end. She's also very well known as a popular science communicator. She's just taken up the Hawking Chair in Cosmology and Science Communication at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario. Professor Mack has an undergraduate degree in physics from Caltech and obtained her PhD in astrophysics from Princeton. After postdoctoral positions in Cambridge and Melbourne, she became an assistant professor at North Carolina State University before joining the Perimeter Institute this year. Professor Mack works at the intersection between fundamental physics and astrophysics. Her research considers dark matter, vacuum decay, the formation of galaxies, observable traces of co cosmic evolution, and the epoch of reionization. Professor Mack has described dark matter as one of science's most pressing enigmas. She's worked on dark matter self-annihilation and investigated whether the accretion of dark matter could result in the growth of primordial black holes. She's worked on the impact of primordial black holes on cosmic microwave background and has become increasingly interested too in the end of the universe. Here at G Research, we're also trying to predict the future, but whereas our predictions are mostly concerned with future stock price movement, and at best we're only trying to look a few days into the future, Professor Mack's work deals with the entire universe at timescales of up to 10 to the 100 years into the future. Professor Mack is very well known as a science communicator. She writes regularly for BBC Science Focus and Scientific American, as well as The Guardian, The New York Times, Slate, and Time. She has more than 400,000 followers on Twitter. Her response to a climate change denier on that platform gained mainstream coverage, as did her chirp for LIGO upon the first detection of gravitational waves. Professor Mack's first book, the End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, was published in 2020. It considers five scenarios for the end of the universe, both theoretically and practically, and has received positive reviews, both for its science outreach accuracy and its wit. It was a New York Times notable book and featured on the best books of the year list for the Washington Post, The Economist, New Scientist, Publishers Weekly, and The Guardian. I hope this gives you some, an idea of Professor Mack's accomplishments, both as a researcher and as a science communicator. Therefore, I'm delighted to introduce her as our distinguished speaker this evening. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, I hope you all can hear me all right. Uh, great. So, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the beginning of the universe, the end of the universe, and kind of what happens in between. Um, I will be skipping some steps, <laughs> but uh, I, w I want to give you an idea of the, the sort of story of the cosmos and, and of the creation of structure in the universe and where things are all headed in the future. So you may have heard that we are all star stuff, uh, Carl Sagan was fond of talking about how we are made of star stuff, we are a way for the universe to know itself. And this is true, mostly. Uh, the atoms in our body, many of them were formed in the, the final stages of the destruction of stars uh, many generations ago. But most of what we're made of has never been part of a star at all. And the story of our universe does not begin with stars either. Uh, the story of the universe starts with static. And I'll explain that in a moment. Let's first get oriented. So we live in a galaxy. When we look out into the night sky, we see a stretch of stars and gas and dust across the sky because we are in the center, in the, not in the center, in, in the sort of outer reaches of a spiral galaxy that if we could see it from the outside would look a lot like this. This is actually the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor large galaxy, a collection of stars and gas and dust and black holes. 
And one of the things that we can do is we can look out at other galaxies in the universe and we can see um, hundreds of thousands of galaxies in images like this. This is, this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And in this picture, pretty much every little point, every little smudge is a galaxy, its own collection of millions or billions of stars. There are a couple of points of light here that are stars in our own galaxy. This is one of them. But pretty much everything else is an entire galaxy here and here and here and here and all these tiny little dots. There are something like 10,000 galaxies in this picture. And when we look at images like this, there are a few things that we can learn from that. And one is we can learn about fantastic diversity of structure in our universe. And we can also see that almost every galaxy in this image, almost everything that we see in the universe is moving away from us. The universe is expanding. When we look out into the night sky, we see distant galaxies and they're all receding from us and the farther away, the more quickly they are receding. And as we look out in every direction, the galaxies are getting farther apart from us and farther apart from each other. And it's not just that we're unpopular in the universe. Uh, it's that the universe is expanding in every direction. And from that observation, there are a couple of important things that we can get. And one of them is that if the universe is expanding now, it must have been smaller in the past. Everything must have been closer together in the past. And we can go back in time. Uh, we can extrapolate back in time and find that matter was closer and denser and more packed together and the universe was hotter and more filled with stuff. And in the 1960s, astronomers took this idea to its logical conclusion that if the universe is expanding now, then it must have been, then at some point, the universe was hot and dense and filled with cosmic radiation. And that's really the Big Bang Theory, just the idea that the universe was hot and dense and in some sense smaller in the distant past. And so there should have been some point at which the whole universe was just filled with radiation. And that's where the static comes in. So this is an image of uh, astronomers Penzias and Wilson, who in 1964 discovered that there was some kind of static in their, their microwave antenna. Every direction they looked in the sky, there was uh, a little bit of fuzz in their signal coming from every direction. And they tried lots of things to get rid of this static. They thought that maybe it was something to do with the pigeons that were roosting in the telescope. Maybe it was some kind of loose cable, but nothing made it go away. And it was uniform throughout the sky. If you made a picture of that static, it looked kind of like this. Uh, this is a, a projection, just like if you uh, project the Earth on a, an oval. Uh, this is the sky projected on an oval. It's essentially the same temperature in every direction. This microwave radiation looks the same everywhere. And when this signal was studied, it was found that it really wasn't interference. It really wasn't a problem with the telescope. It was real and it was very important. This, it wasn't an astrophysical, an atmospheric phenomenon. It was the first glimpse of the Big Bang itself. This is an image of the same signal with the contrast stretched so that you can see variations at a, a level of about one in a hundred thousand, where there are places where the sky is a little bit hotter, a little bit cooler, but still glowing with that microwave radiation. And this is the sort of first image we had of how that early light varied in different parts of the universe. This is what the universe looked like when it was only 300,000 or so years old. This was the, this glowing, hot, early universe. And this is a direct image of it. There are a few ways that we know that this is a direct image of the very early, hot universe. One of those ways is by looking at the spectrum of this light. So we can look at the sort of spatial variations of this light and see that there are some places where the universe is a little hotter, a little cooler. But we can also look at the spectrum and it looks like this. So this is the intensity of light as a function of frequency in the microwave part of the spectrum. So if you're um, not familiar with that, you know, there's, there's a sort of peak at a certain color in the microwave radiation and then it's a little 
uh, dimmer in uh, some colors, a little to the red of that, a little to the blue of that. And this particular curve, this spectrum, is called a black body radiation spectrum. Um, this is the kind of light that you see if something is just glowing because it's hot. If you took a spectrum of the light produced by a poker that's been sitting in the fire, it produces exactly this spectrum. And the early universe has sort of the most perfect black body spectrum ever measured, which means that when we look at that light from the beginning of the universe, that light that's coming from every direction, that's coming from a time when the universe was hot and dense and glowing with its own heat, that light is, is really just coming from, from space being so hot, so full of, full of radiation, that space is glowing just from heat, the same way that, that this, this uh, poker is glowing from heat. It's thermal radiation, and it tells us that there was a time when all of the universe was full of this uh, hot, glowing plasma. And with newer instruments, we've been able to refine this picture. So this is from the WMAP instrument from 2010, where you can see more and more detail in that first image of the beginning of the universe. And we can find, refine it even further. This is from the Planck satellite. We can see even more detail in that early light from the beginning of the universe. And just to be clear, that this is everywhere because in every direction we look, if we look far enough away, we were looking so far back in time that we're seeing a time when the entire universe was full of plasma radiation, like of the glowing of, of the hot plasma of the Big Bang. So we are looking directly at the earliest stages of the universe in every direction all around us. And when we look at these little fluctuations, we can see that, the, that these are actually acoustic fluctuations, which means that these are sort of frozen sound waves humming through this early hot plasma. The, the universe, the early universe was so dense that it was loud. There was this constant churning and humming of the, the different uh, bits of matter and radiation moving around in this hot glowing early universe. So we can see the beginning of the universe. We can see the first 380,000 years of the universe. This is the picture of that hot, glowing early universe. But there are a couple of problems with this picture. A couple of things that don't fit with the kind of standard idea of the universe starting from some kind of singularity and then just expanding and cooling in the kind of, in the way that initially when we realized the universe was expanding, that was sort of the first hypothesis, that there was some kind of initial event, and then the universe has been expanding and cooling since then. So there are two problems with this picture. One is the fact that it's mostly uniform, that these fluctuations are very, very small, just one part in 100,000. Why, why is the universe the same temperature in every direction of the sky? Uh, there's no reason for that to happen if, unless you set up the, early, the initial conditions of the universe very, very carefully. Uh, if you look at uh, as far as you can look in one direction and as far as you can look in the other direction and you get exactly the same temperature, then something must have happened to make those two parts of the universe agree because they were never close enough together to uh, be able to come to the same temperature through thermal equilibrium, through the way that, uh, you know, if you leave a coffee cup in a room for long enough, it'll become the temperature of the room. Uh, that never was able to happen in the universe as far as we know if you just extrapolate to sort of a singularity, a, a big bang point, which is the way that people usually envision it. The other problem is these fluctuations. Where do these little fluctuations come from? Uh, why, does it, why do they have the pattern they do? That's the other question, big question when looking at this picture. Why do we get those sound waves in just the way that we do? Why do we get uh, patches of the universe where it's a little bit colder, a little bit hotter in the very early universe? And our best guess at the moment for, of how that all happened, how the universe became the same temperature in every direction, and where those uh, fluctuations came from, is an idea called cosmic inflation. So the idea here is that the universe has been expanding uh, since you know before the cosmic microwave background, this uh, background light. But in the time before that, in the time before that hot fireball stage, what we call the hot Big Bang there was a period of very, very rapid expansion. And during that period of very, very rapid expansion, 
the, it, uh, sort of, it, it sort of stretched out the universe so much that, that it would all become sort of the same temperature. I'll show you a little illustration of that in a minute. Um, so there's this very rapid expansion, and the origin of these little fluctuations are from the oscillation of a quantum field. I'll tell you a little bit more that, about that in a moment as well. Um, but the picture that we have, essentially, oh, this is a very bright screen, uh, <laughs> is uh, that the universe uh, went from being extremely small to uh, increasing in size by many, many orders of magnitude over an extremely small amount of time, something like 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And then began the kind of expansion that we see now. And it was during that inflationary period when quantum fluctuations of the field that was governing that expansion uh, laid down the seeds for those little fluctuations. So let me give you a sort of illustration of, of what I mean by that. So imagine that the sort of initial state of the universe is something that was very, uh, you know, not uniform. Maybe, maybe there were parts of the universe that were uh, much hotter or colder or high, higher density or lower density. It's like uh, some kind of big, complicated picture. And this circle represents kind of the observable universe, the part of the universe that, you know, would become our entire observable universe now, everything we can see. In the sort of standard picture of just, you know, evolution from a singularity, you would be seeing a lot of fluctuations, a lot of different uh, sort of colors, different temperatures within that circle. But if there was a stage of very, very rapid expansion in the universe, then we're kind of zooming into a much more uniform part of that initial state of the universe. And, you know, you can kind of keep, keep zooming in because it was so much of a, uh, an expansion that at some point you're kind of looking at just a, a tiny bit, a sort of single pixel in this vast, varied, much, much larger universe. And so that sort of uniform, made, it makes the whole universe much more uniform. But there's a trick to that, which is that once you've zoomed in on just a, a pixel or two, you're looking at scales that are so small that they have uh, quantum fluctuations in them, that, that there's some, uh, whatever field is sort of governing this expansion, there's gonna be little fluctuations in that, and then, then that whole region that has this little static in it, that's gonna expand to be our entire observable universe. And those little fluctuations in the quantum field that governs that expansion, those little fluctuations are gonna be what lays down the, uh, the uh, fluctuations in that cosmic microwave background, that picture we have of the, um, of the very early universe. So when we look at this picture on the screen, there we go. So when we look at this picture then, um, these fluctuations in the density of that early plasma are actually fluctuations in the, in the quantum field governing the expansion uh, stretched out to cosmic scales. There are a few different ways to think about how that happened. One way you can think about it is that as the expansion was occurring, it kind of, it would sort of, the, the whole universe was expanding because it was filled with a, a quantum field, a, a sort of energy field, which we call the inflaton field. Uh, the inflaton field is a scalar field. A scalar field is something that has a value at every point. So like, for example, in this room, there's a temperature field, which is a scalar field. So every point in the room has a temperature and it's just a number associated with every point in space. Uh, in the early universe, we think there was an inflaton field, and the inflaton field had some value everywhere in space, and it evolved over time. And, and so what we think probably happened is that at different parts, at, at different stages as the universe is expanding, in some places, the inflaton field would change a little bit in different ways so that the expansion would go a little bit faster, a little bit slower in different places, and that set down the different um, densities of the universe that made the difference in the sort of uh, places where the universe was more or less dense in this picture. So this is showing us places where the universe had a little bit more expansion or a little bit less expansion in those very early times. So this is the cosmic microwave background, and I'm spending so much time on this because this picture this snapshot of our very early universe is one of the things that gives us the most information about the origin of structure in the universe, the, the initial conditions of the universe, the 
why the universe is the way it is, and it tells us about what the universe is made of. It tells us about the fundamental physics governing the cosmos. Um, one thing that we do with this, we, we, we do a lot of statistical analysis of this picture. It's a very important picture. Um, and we can do statistical analysis on the, the little fluctuations here, and, and we can uh, do a uh, multipole decomposition, which is where we take you know, different sort of sizes of filters and look at the amount of uh, structure in each of those uh, filters. So you know, sort of one degree, five degrees um, on the sky. And when you do that, you get a curve that looks like this, where for different angular scales, there's different amounts of power, so different amounts of uh, sort of temperature fluctuation. And this uh, green line that passes through all these data points this is a, uh, what's called the concordance model of cosmology. So essentially what we've done is we've uh, modeled out how, the, how that early plasma would oscillate and sort of jiggle around based on a different set of components of the universe. Uh, so how much of the universe is made of matter or radiation or dark matter and dark energy, which I'll talk, talk about in a moment. Um, this hot Big Bang picture where, you know, you have this, this uh, hot phase of, of radiation in the early universe, inflation, setting down those initial conditions, and then, you know, some idea that the universe is basically homogenous, same everywhere, looks the same in every direction. This is called the concordance model of cosmology, and there are numbers associated with each of these values. And so when you put, to get, put that all together, you get a line that perfectly goes through all of these data points. We have fantastic agreement between uh, a model of the universe based on these sort of fundamental properties and ingredients and what we see in the cosmic microwave background. Um, it's, it's just incredibly accurate. I mean, these, in these uh, dots, there are error bars here that you mostly can't even see because they're so, they're so small and it's such a tight agreement between the theory and uh, the experiment. Over here, on the really large scales, we just, there are not so many ways to chop up the sky in 90 degree, uh, uh, you know, patches, so we have some uh, uncertainty there. But um, even down to fluctuations on very, very small scales, we have excellent agreement with the theory. So we have a very good idea of sort of what the universe is made of and how that process worked in the, in the early universe that gave us this picture. And there's another check we can do on this, on this uh, theory, which is that we can you know, look at the, the, this, these fluctuations, kind of look at the statistics of how matter was laid out in the very early universe based on uh, these fluctuations and say, okay, you know, the, there was uh, clumping on you know, kind of these scales and there were large regions of, um, of you know, less uh, matter on, on certain scales, more matter on other scales. And we can use the, that as an initial condition for a simulation of how the universe grew. So what we do is we take the, the statistics of the matter distribution from the cosmic microwave background, this early light from the universe, and we put it in a uh, simulation of, uh, of how matter grew uh, from, like, just uh, you know, how galaxies and stars grew up, basically. How matter clumped together over time to uh, grow into the, the largest structures we see in the universe. So you take the statistics of the cosmic microwave background, you give it to your simulation that just has matter in it, and you let that simulation run. And as that simulation runs, the places with more matter clump together, the places, places with less matter become these giant voids. And you end up with a picture like this, which is the cosmic web. So in this picture, sort of every one of these little dots, every, one, every sort of white dot is kind of roughly the size of a galaxy. And so you have clusters of galaxies, and then these giant voids with just a few galaxies in them. And you have these filaments where galaxies kind of line up um, where there are places where there's a little bit more matter. And this is, you know, this is like the, the modern day distribution of matter in the universe. So that simulation would, you know, would cover sort of billions of years of the buildup of regular matter in the universe. So after the fireball cooled and you just had a bunch of hydrogen in the universe, that hydrogen came together and started to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies and so on. And this is, this is just a simulation. Um, this simulation, in fact, only includes dark matter. So I'll talk a little bit about dark matter in a minute, but uh, essentially, 
We know that most of the matter in the universe, or we're pretty sure that most of the matter in the universe is something that's invisible and mysterious, and we call it dark matter. Um, it's an essential part of the universe to get the agreement with the cosmomicrate background that we saw a moment ago, and it's essential to the buildup of structure in the universe. If you do this simulation with regular matter, you get a totally different picture. And the reason that we think that this is the right picture is because when we compare it to actual observations of galaxies in the universe, it's a really perfect match. So in this uh, image, so these are, these are uh, images from galaxy surveys. So each, each colored dot in this picture is a galaxy mapped somewhere in the sky. And um, two of these slices are real data, and the other two are from simulations based entirely on dark matter, where you just, you put the dark matter in there, and then you kind of sprinkle the galaxies in where the matter is most dense. And if you're not an astronomer who's used to looking at these pictures, you probably can't really tell the difference. Uh, the statistics are exactly the same. The distribution of matter is exactly what we would predict from uh, a universe that's dominated by, uh, that, where the matter is dominated by dark matter, and the statistics of the, the collection of matter is based on the, uh, the distribution of matter in the cosmic microwave background. So if you are an astronomer, you probably recognize that the blue images are from, uh, from actual day galaxy surveys, and the red ones are from a simulation. But statistically, they're exactly the same. So what we've done is we've taken the earliest light in the universe, the, uh, the cosmic microwave background, this, this microwave hum from every direction in the sky. We've looked at the little fluctuations in that that were set down uh, in, in the first fraction of a second by the, by the oscillation of a quantum field. Um, and then we've taken the, the statistics of how that initial plasma was laid out and we've given it to a simulation of just dark matter, and we found the, dis the distribution of galaxies in the universe that we see today. So we've got an in incredible agreement between what we, what we think happened in the, in the tiniest fraction of a second after whatever the beginning of the universe was to galaxy clusters across the universe that have spent 13.8 billion years growing. So we have this picture now of a universe that is uh, full of uh, clusters and filaments and giant voids, this cosmic web that stretches out across the universe that is, as far as we can tell, fairly uniform. You know, there's no special part of this picture. You know, uh, the, the regions over here look a lot like the regions over there. We seem to be in, in no special place in the universe. Um, and we understand the, the, the distribution of matter on the very largest scales, and we have a really good theory of how, it, how they came about from uh, the very first moments in the smallest scales in the cosmos. So going from there, you know, the question is, now that we have this amazing distribution of matter, this amazing diversity of structures in the universe, um, you know, what happens next? Are we doomed to just kind of fade away into nothingness as, as the universe evolves. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, well, I'm gonna talk about a couple of different possibilities for the future of the universe. Um, in, in my book, I cover five different possibilities. I don't quite have time to go through all five today, but I'll tell you very briefly uh, what, uh, where, you know, what we're sort of thinking in those terms. So one you might have heard of is the big crunch, the idea that you know, as the universe is currently expanding, maybe someday it'll come back together and we'll all be cooked in that, uh, in that plasma, roiling plasma as, as the universe collapses. There's the heat death, which is probably the most likely one where the universe continues expanding forever and kind of fades away into nothingness. The big rip, which is kind of a worst case scenario of dark energy, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but that's where the universe is sort of torn apart by the expansion itself. Um, there's vacuum decay, which is my personal favorite, that involves a giant bubble of doom that, that uh, envelops all of space. And then there are a few different ideas for how the universe might have some kind of cyclic uh, behavior, a bounce, where it might uh, end and then have a new beginning. But um, three of these possibilities are really asking the question, just what is dark energy doing? Like, what is it that... Um, what, what, uh, what is this mysterious stuff we call dark energy doing? What will it do in the future? 
Now, I haven't really talked much about dark energy yet. I talked about dark matter, which is this invisible matter that seems to be the, the sort of scaffolding upon which all of cosmic structure is built. Dark energy is almost its opposite. Dark energy is something that's making the universe expand faster. Um, it's sort of stretching out the cosmos. So I often show a, uh, a sort of disambiguation between dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter is something that has mass. It distorts space toward itself. You know, you've probably seen images like this where there's sort of a gravity well where a massive thing will kind of bend space toward it. That's Einstein's picture of gravity, that, that space is bent by massive objects. So dark matter is something that, that, that pulls space together, that pulls matter together, or is dark matter is, is pulling matter together. Dark energy is something that's kind of pulling space apart. So dark energy is, is pulling apart. Um, dark matter is bringing together. These are, they act in, in really very opposite kinds of ways. So let me tell you the sort of, the sort of default case of what dark energy might do. And that has to do with the heat death. Okay, so right now the universe is expanding, right? Um, and we've known for a long time that the universe is expanding since uh, sort of the 1960s. It's been clear, or the 1920s, sorry. It's been clear that the universe is expanding, um, that galaxies are getting farther and farther apart from each other. And in the 1990s, there was a big effort to determine how quickly the expansion of the universe was slowing down. Um, so to illustrate this, um, I have to, to do, I have to work with a prop here. Okay, so we know that the universe began with some kind of a, a rapid expansion of some kind. The universe has been expanding from the beginning. Um, we also know that gravity pulls, right? So as the universe is expanding, all these galaxies kind of want to pull back together, right? They've all got gravity pulling themselves, pulling together. So it should be that as the universe expands, the expansion should be always slowing down because gravity is kind of putting on the brakes. It's kind of like if you throw a ball up into the air, um, what's happening is you've given it a push, and as it goes up, it's slowing down and slowing down. At some point, it stops and falls back. Um, so that would be a kind of big crunch scenario, right? The, the Big Bang was not very strong. It uh, gave the universe an initial, initial push, um, but then gravity won and pulled everything back together. That's, that's a kind of, uh, that's one scenario for what, how, you know, how much, if the expansion is slowing down that quickly, then you expect a big crunch to happen. Um, another possibility is if I were extraordinarily strong, and if I could throw this at 11.2 kilometers a second, then it would reach escape velocity, it would travel out uh, forever, um, you know, leave the Earth and go off into space, and it would always be slowing down a little bit, but it would never stop, right? That if you just reached exactly escape velocity. Uh, in principle, you could throw it even faster than that, um, and, uh, the, the, and it would just kind of coast off at a steady speed, but it would, it would kind of be slowing down a little bit and then and you know, just be kind of coasting in the universe forever. And those are sort of the three possibilities that you expect when you have an initial event that causes that push, and then gravity uh, is slowing things down. So astronomers were trying to measure the deceleration parameter, the number that would tell us how quickly the expansion is slowing down, and whether it's so quickly that uh, we'll all come crashing back together, or whether the expansion is slowing down a little bit, but you know, the, it was so fast that the galaxies are gonna get so far apart from each other that their gravity is just not gonna be important after a while and they'll continue to, uh, to separate from each other. Um, and so uh, in the 1990s, they were measuring this and they found something really strange, which was that the expansion wasn't slowing down. The deceleration parameter was a negative number. Uh, the expansion was actually speeding up. The universe was accelerating in its expansion. And, and that's about as weird as if, you know, I throw this ball up in the air and it slows down for a little while and then it just shoots off into the ceiling, right? Um, pretty similar physics. You, you really don't expect something to push the ball into the ceiling after you've let it go. If all, if all you have is the initial push and gravity, it should always be slowing down or it should come back, but it shouldn't speed up and go off into space. Uh, but that seems to be what's happening to the universe. Something is making the universe expand faster. We don't know what it is. We call it dark energy. And if our, our best guess about dark energy is that it's probably what we call a cosmological constant. 
which is uh, just sort of a property of the universe, a uh, property of space that has this sort of stretchiness built into it. There's a sort of energy of space that causes uh, expansion that's written into Einstein's equations. And uh, you know, as space is getting bigger, there's more and more space, so the expansion speeds up more and more, and you get this accelerating expansion. And um, if that's the case, then what will happen is as time goes on, galaxies will get farther and farther apart from each other. Uh, our galaxy, which in the distant future will have merged with the Andromeda galaxy and a couple of other local galaxies, will be more and more isolated. In about 100 billion years, if you look out into the night sky, if you, if you put the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit and look out into the sky, uh, you will see nothing. All the other galaxies will be so far away from us and moving away so quickly that, that they won't be visible anymore to our telescopes. In 100 billion years, we'll be entirely isolated from the rest of the universe. And then, you know, by then, most of the stars in our own galaxy will have, uh, have burned out. Uh, there will be no more stars being formed because we won't have uh, any more gas coming in to fuel the, the formation of new stars. Uh, the, there will be a bunch of black holes, the black holes will evaporate, matter will decay, and we will be left in a cold, dark, empty universe. And that's called the heat death. And it's a very sad story. Um, but it would be a very, very long time from now, and uh, it could be worse. So. The Big Rip is an idea where dark energy kind of goes a little badly. So I mentioned before, you know, the idea behind cosmological constant is gravity is pulling everything together. A cosmological constant would kind of start, kind of push everything apart. And when it was first uh, hypothesized by Einstein, it was really meant to keep the universe static, to perfectly balance the gravity of everything so that everything just kind of stays where it's at and everything just kind of stays still. But when, when it was discovered that the universe was expanding, we didn't need that anymore. Things weren't falling together because they were moving away from each other. That was taken away. But the thing about a cosmological constant is it's, it's constant. Um, in any region of space, the amount of cosmological constant is not increasing. The amount of this sort of stretchiness is not increasing, which means that if you have a space in which there is a galaxy or a building or something that's bound matter, then the, the cosmological constant isn't gonna mess with that because it's already there and it's not, it's, it's not building up over time. Um, it is staying constant though, which is why you get this decay. So if you have uh, you know, the density of stuff as a function of time, matter will decrease in density as the universe gets bigger, radiation will decrease in density as the universe gets bigger, but because the cosmological constant is a function of space itself, uh, it doesn't matter, the universe gets bigger, there's more space, there's more cosmological constant, the density is always the same. And that's why you get a heat death, is because as time goes on, eventually, most of the universe's cosmological constant is this dark energy, and everything else just kind of dilutes away. And that's why you end up with a cold, dark, empty, empty universe, because all that's left is a cosmological constant. The way it could be worse is that this density is constant, but there are some models of dark energy that are not a cosmological constant where the dark energy does build up within things, where the dark energy density uh, actually increases over time. It's called phantom dark energy. And what that would do is it would build up within objects. It would build up within galaxies and tear galaxies apart. Here's a, a very, uh, very low-tech sort of illustration of that from NASA, <laughs> which I just love. <laughs> Um, but what it would do is it would, it would build up within clusters of galaxies, within galaxies, and on smaller and smaller scales, it would start to pull apart the universe. It would pull apart first clusters, then galaxies, then stellar star systems. It would pull apart, uh, to pull the planets away from stars, build up within stars and planets and moons, and, and just break everything. And at some point, there would be an event where the, the scale factor of the universe would go to infinity, which means that the, the distance between any two points arbitrarily close together would go to infinity. The whole universe would be torn apart. That's called the Big Rip. Now, it probably can't happen. Uh, most, most physicists uh, think that phantom dark energy is a bad idea. Uh, it breaks certain rules about uh, energy conditions in the universe that we think we probably should keep. 
but we can't rule it out with, uh, with data just yet. What happens is there's a, there's a number that we can measure based on sort of the, the distribution of matter in the universe and, and uh, galaxy surveys and stuff called the equation of state parameter. The equation of state parameter is a measure of the ratio of the pressure to the density of whatever stuff you're talking about. And the cosmological constant has a value of negative one. So the pressure and the density are opposite each other, which means it's negative pressure, which is weird, and I could go into that, but it, it would take some time. Um, so they're, they're exactly balanced in a cosmological constant universe. A phantom dark energy universe has W less than minus one. Um, so any number less than minus one for this equation of state parameter suggests that the universe, that the dark energy is phantom dark energy, which suggests the universe is eventually heading toward a big rip. Now we can, again, try to measure this number, and what we want to find with this number is obviously we'll want to find negative one, right? Um, the problem is you can never measure a number with arbitrary accuracy. So there's always going to be some error bars around that number that we measure, and you know it's possible that those error bars will include numbers less than minus one if it really is negative one. And so, you know, we've got our Planck satellite um, up there measuring the cosmic microwave background, trying to find uh, information about this equation of state parameter. And what we want to find is that. What we actually find is that. Um, <laughs> which means that, you know, within the errors, it still could be negative one. I mean, it's very likely to be negative one if, if you believe, you know, that the cosmological constant makes more sense than, than phantom dark energy. But we just don't really know for sure, and we can't really quite rule that out. But what we can do is we can plug this number into an equation that tells us how, how long it would take for the universe to be totally ripped apart if it is phantom dark energy. And we can get a number for the time until cosmic doom. Right? So, so based on that number and those error bars, we have at least about 188 billion years. Which is fine, because by 100 billion years, there's, nothing gonna be, there's not going to be anything interesting in the universe anyway. Might as well tear it apart. Um, so, you know, so we have quite a long time. But there's, there's one possibility I want to talk about just briefly uh, that could technically happen at any moment. So <laughs> vacuum decay is, a, a, as I might have mentioned, my, my personal favorite uh, theory of the end of the universe. Um, because it's a really interesting combination of what we know about the, the smallest scales, the tiniest particles in the universe, and uh, how that could affect the evolution of the cosmos as a whole. And it kind of all comes down to the Higgs boson, sort of. So you've probably heard of the Higgs boson. It was discovered at CERN. This is an event display from CERN, uh, Large Hadron Collider. What the Large Hadron Collider does is it smashes particles, uh, protons together, looks at the debris that comes out, and in 2012, uh, they saw a hint of a new particle called the Higgs boson. And you may have heard that the Higgs boson has something to do with how particles got mass in the early universe. The important thing about the Higgs boson is not the Higgs boson, it's the Higgs field. So the Higgs field is a scalar field. So we talked about a scalar field a little while ago, the infanton field being a scalar field. Um, that's a hypothetical one. We don't know for sure that the infanton exists. But the Higgs field has to exist because we found the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is sort of an excitation of that scalar field. So the Higgs field is an energy field that, that pervades all of space. It has some value at every point in space. And what the Higgs field is doing, the value of the Higgs field, is connected to how particle physics works in our universe. It's connected to the, what we call the vacuum state of the universe. So for, so, what we know about the Higgs field, based on this experiment and, and the theory that connects, uh, connects these things together, is that the Higgs field had a different value in the very early universe, and it changed at some point. And when it changed, it set up the conditions for particle physics being what they are today. So it, it created the, uh, the right conditions for the existence of all the particles in the standard model of particle physics. It set up the fundamental forces. It gave, us, it gave mass to certain particles that needed to have mass so that we could have atoms and molecules and all of the things that we appreciate as matter. Um, so I'll just briefly go through the standard model of particle physics uh, because it's relevant to the next point. So this is the standard model of particle physics. Um, with uh, Higgs boson as the latest piece. So these are all the particles we've ever detected in an experiment. These are all the particles that we know exist 
in the universe. So in the blue, sort of purple up there, we have the quarks. The quarks are the components of protons and neutrons. So you know, the up quark and the down quark make up protons and neutrons in different combinations. And then there's the charm quark and the strange quark and the top quark and the bottom quark. They were named in the 70s. Um, and the relationships between some of these particles are important to understanding kind of the, the sort of how the whole model of, of the standard model fits together. So we'll get back to that in a moment. Then there's, in the green here, we have the leptons. So there's the neutrinos, which are these kind of ghostly particles that are produced in fusion and pass through us all the time. There's the electron and its heavier cousins, the muon and the tau. So you know, the electron is the one that goes around the center of the atom, only you know, when you learn more quantum mechanics, you find out they're not really orbiting. They're kind of in a cloud of electronness uh, surrounding the nucleus of an atom. And then in the red, those are the gauge bosons. Those are the force carriers. So there's the photon that's the carrier of electromagnetism, particles of light. Uh, it